welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for HGA, and I'm your host today. We, um, we are sponsored today by Shack Spindle Company, tools for the crafts we love. Spinning wheels, looms, and accessories, everything you need at shackspindle.com. We will take questions today, as we always do. It'll be the last 15 minutes of the session. If you will, please put those in the Q&A and not in the chat. I can see the Q&A, but I can't keep track of the chat. But we love your comments and, and any kind of added information that you have, those are wonderful. Um, today, we have Sean Dougal and Andrew Paulson with Dougal Paulson. Sean and Andrew are the co-founders of the multidisciplinary art and design studio, Dougal Paulson. They seek beauty through forms of weaving, furniture, lighting, and objects. Using narrative as the thread that binds ideas together. Their unique take on visual storytelling is the starting point for the creation of objects that straddle the fine, decorative, and the graphic arts, as you will see today. Based in Southern California, Dougal Paulson approaches their practice with a focus on curiosity and discovery. Hello, guys. Welcome to Textiles and Tea. Hey there. Hi. How we are, are so excited Hi. to have you here. We are We're too. Excited to be here. <laughs> we'll have to say you're our first two people interviewed at once. It's what Great. an honor, right? Well, thank you. Thank you. What an honor. <laughs> We always start with one question. The most important question is, what is your favorite teas? Since we're asking both of you. Oh, we're huge yeah. fans of tea. We are yeah. very big fans of tea. We're drinking a, a, an oolong at the moment, but kind of, you know, during like colder months, we like things with a little more spice to them. And, but um, yeah, we drink tea every morning. So- uh, Something yeah. wrong with a good green tea. Green tea, yeah, everything. Yeah. We love it all. <laughs> well, good, 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 good. Um, how did you get started with fiber? And that may lead into how did you meet and start working together? We're all curious to know. Sure, well, it kind of started with how we met, I guess that's kind of where it all began. When Andy and I first met in Venice Beach, was it a little 12 years ago? 12 years ago. Yeah, 12 Sometime. years ago, time flies. Um, I was, we were in completely different professions. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the garage door rolled up. It was kind of a big creative industry complex. Um, and Andy just walked by and we, we shared glances and we were friends for about a year and a half before anything really kind of sparked up between us. But when that spark did happen, it was kind of a creative birth from the beginning, don't you say? Yeah, no, it happened very quickly. Yeah. Um, Sean has a background in ceramics. So watching him throw a pot is better than anything you could see on TV. Um, it's, it's very inspiring, very, um, it's just super fun to watch. So I think I kind of half envied him his craft and was also inspired by it as well so um i kind of you know i had always had kind of this thing in the back of my head about about weaving uh, a, a lot of the the my ancestors and people in my family were very yarn oriented so i kind of grew up around yarn and just kind of on a wild hair, we uh, I, I found a, um, a loom on Craigslist. Yeah, Andy was like, can we go get this loom? I was like, yeah, let's go get it. So we drove to what, Malibu? Malibu, I yeah. think. And, um, and we found this like really amazing woman who, she was doing costume design, She right? did costume design and for she, the industry, she did hand -woven for Hollywood, for, but yeah. she was kind of like liquidating a bunch of stuff and she had just, it was like opening up a treasure trove in her garage of just like fiber and materials. And, so and she stuff. was like, take stuff from me, take yeah, it. So it was like, like yeah. you know, I'm sure this is a, not a, an uncommon story, but that's where we got our first loom. Yeah, right? and I will say it was a shack spindle, yeah. uh, four, four shafts, um, still have it um, somewhere, somewhere back there, <laughs> but um, still use it. It's a great loom. Um, they're not paying us anything. They're not paying us anything anyway. So. Um, but we're big advocates for Shack Spindle looms as well. Really, really great looms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, going on about your different backgrounds, um, it's interesting that um, you weren't exactly, like you said, you weren't like trained as weavers and that's what you ended up doing. Yeah. So I'm curious, how did those different experiences and, and training and backgrounds impact on your work that you do now? I would think there would have some real connection. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, everything's connected in a way. I mean, I had, I was doing set design, doing art direction, right. uh, 
for music and live television stuff. And you yeah. were doing book publishing. I worked in book publishing for, I lived in New York for most of my 20s and then um, came out to LA, um, which doesn't immediately translate to book publishing. There's not a whole lot of that out here, but um, I did end up finding a little publishing house uh, next to where his production design studio thank was. Uh, thank goodness, yeah. Uh, but it, it, um, yeah, I mean, I think as, as you mentioned in, in, that, um, in that intro, Kathy, everything we do is very narrative driven, the, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the approach we take to our, to our work. So we begin with a story, we begin with an idea and um, the work kind of evolves based on that, based mm -hmm. on that story. Mm -hmm. So um, I, think, I think, you know, having a, a, a sense of, um, uh, of, of beginning, middle and end kind of narrative and story, I think that really has informed our work a great deal. And I think owning your own business, I mean, we can't forget that being an artist is being in a business. Mm -hmm. So we both had very kind of high performing jobs in completely different fields that taught us a set of skills that we definitely implement on a daily basis, creatively and business wise. So it, 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 all of those kind of things just kind of find their way into, into our yeah. systems. Yeah, right. I'd say there's definitely also a, a place for art school and mm -hmm. receiving the crit of all that. Sean went to art school. I did. I kind of went to an art high school, but I didn't really go to, to uh, uh, an art school for for, you know, later education. But, you know, I do think that since we are self-taught uh, uh, fiber artists, uh, I think we approach our work with um, we don't have any prejudices. We don't have any, um, you know, any any sort of preconceived ideas about the way things should be, or uh, you know, the way people write about it in books necessarily. So um, I think that's been kind of liberating for us as well to, you know, yeah, to pursue. Kind yeah, of. Yeah, we we started off with our own voice. I think from the very beginning. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 There you go. <laughs> I like that. All right. Well, one of the images we have right now is called Atlas Six Twenty. And this is made using wire, correct? Yeah. So wire. how did you, how did you start using wire? And I cannot imagine how many challenges there mm. are. But what are the challenges of using a wire instead of like a cotton or a wool? Well, the decision to jump into metal really stemmed from our first collection, which was called Dark Matter, which we. When we first got together, we, like I said, we just started creatively making things and making the ideas that were um, gestating in our, in our sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was starting off with bronze and lost in the, using lost wax and creating furniture pieces and objects. And as that collection developed and our skills and weaving grew, we 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 try to keep our materiality very limited. So the metal was kind of just like a first go-to for it was us. It was like, it makes, of, it kind yeah. of made sense with the, with the, with the full body of work that we were creating at that time. Yeah. It was kind of in response to all the metal work that we were kind of already doing. Right. Um, it kind of made sense because we were working at that point in, um, in the idea of a, kind of a, a cohesive or an overarching collection. So we wanted to keep everything kind of in the same, at least material voice, I guess you could say. Right. Um, so it just in terms of the challenges of working with wire, um, you're imagining correctly, it's, um, it's, it's not easy. Um, so I, I guess this is kind of, this, this is a good example of the picture on the left. So um, it, there's no elasticity to wire. That goes without saying, I guess that's kind of an obvious thing to say, but um, in general terms, it's obvious, but in practical terms, uh, it kind of takes all of the things you know about weaving, how to dress a loom, how to thread the heddles, how to get it, you know, how to slay the, how to slay the reed, how to tie it onto the apron bar, all of it, you, you know, you, you, it really kind of turns it on its head and um, you, you have to kind of uh, stop and reimagine everything just a little bit in order to make it work with wire. So, you know, if you can imagine you've got uh, just a strand of silk and you drop one side of it, it's just going to kind of hang from the other, the, the other point. You know, wire, on the other hand, is going to go kind of shroing and it's going to make, you know, it's going to bunch up on itself. So um, it's all about avoiding the kinks. So and as you can see on the right side there, hopefully we've done it um, because, of course, kinks are going to get caught up in your heddles as they come through the castle. So it, there are all sorts of um, sort of workarounds and, and things to, to imagine or you know, kind of um, reimagine, I guess, in terms of traditional techniques. For the most part, it's all traditional techniques, but, um, but a little different. <laughs> and I think the problem too that you run into as, in terms of complications is that metal as a material has memory, much like clay does. So if you bend it, it remembers that and it, right. that mark is there. 
And we're always trying to keep as little of those, if any of those marks out of the material because they will show up in our finished body of work. Right. Um, and, our, and our aesthetic is trying, to, is trying to minimize that as much as possible. Yeah. Hey, hey, Whitney, would you put that picture back up again, that image back up again? I want to ask something real quick. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Whitney. <laughs> she loves it when I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted correct. to see, is that, is that the back beam? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, that is on the, the picture beam. on the left, this, yeah, the silver aluminum piece or whatever that uh, is. Yeah. That's your back beam, right? <laughs> Yeah, so we've kitted out our, um, we've sort of modified all of our looms, uh, at least our workhorse looms, with these really kind of uh, wild, um, super thick aluminum um, custom beams. So we work with an, en an engineer to fabricate um, certain parts to, to make it a little more uh, wire friendly, I guess you mm -hmm. could say. Um, there's no worse feeling in the world than looking at your back beam smiling at you while you're weaving. So, um, like because it's, smiling, I'm not smiling when smile. it's smiling at me. So, yeah. um, so we, uh, we made them much more rigid this way, um, which creates a much more, uh, a straighter fell when you're weaving. So that's, uh, that was a, a good fix. <laughs> the, the metal, the metal yeah. warps were just eating our back beam alive. There's also that. It was just shredding. Right. Yeah. Now, what are, I've got two people already asking, what is the gauge and what kind of wire is this? Well, we would tell you the gauge, but then we'd have to kill you. Then I don't want to be killed. Yes. Okay. So, um, no, <laughs> we, um, so there's, we can't answer that one, unfortunately. It is thin. I will say it's very thin. Okay. We have to use several different gauges depending on um, what we're, what we're trying to achieve. Um, uh, what was the other question? What is the metal? Oh, the, the metal. So all the metals we use now are, um, it's sort of a brass alloy that's been silver plated and then enameled. So it, it's going to keep okay. this color. It's going to keep this shine. Um, it's color fast. It's, you know, however you want to say Most it. Most of it, some of, I mean, some of our first work was raw material, so which had, true. which patin, which did patina over time, which is a really nice effect. Right. Um, so depending on the piece, Sometimes it's enameled, sometimes yeah. it's not. But for the most part, we're working with this enameled yeah. uh, wire product now. It's really beautiful. It's very beautiful. Um, a lot of it is um, drawn in on the East Coast. Some of it, though, is drawn in a factory in Wuhan, China. So oh. while we could not extract it to do our work uh, because of that. So that was like, well, you can't make this stuff up. But <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I have to say, you guys are brave. You're courageous. I mean, you really oh, take God. on. Like, I didn't realize you did copper molding before you did this. I mean, these aren't things where you, you know, pick up a knitting needle and kind of make something. This is kind of dangerous stuff. If else. <laughs> well, knitting it's, knitting requires courage too, doesn't it, Kat? <laughs> different kind of courage. Different kind of I'm courage. I'm going to burn yeah. myself with my knitting. Depends on how fast you're knitting. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Well, <laughs> this kind of leads me to my next question, which I would love to be a fly on the wall yep. while you are trying to go, you're, you've made the design and now you've got a problem solved over to make it a reality. I, and you even said this while ago, like I just envision it as some kind of a roadmap, like here's what you want to make and over here is the finished product. And mm -hmm. I don't see it being a straight line across. So how do you, you know, what do you do next? How do you stay on track? Mm -hmm. Or maybe the cre creative part of it, it isn't staying on track. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think the most important thing is to stay on track because obviously we, we have deadlines to meet and, mm -hmm. and there are always X variables to, to prepare for. And we do try to prevent those as much as possible on the front end. Um, we do, I mean, I guess, do we talk about process here? I mean, from the very yeah. the beginning when we work with a client, you know, we, um, we, they're on board with the design. We've already, we've gone through approval process and we already know where we're going with the project. We've already drawn it up to scale and, and you know, getting it going is really kind of the focus of the piece and getting it done in a timely manner. Yeah, I mean, we usually, we typically start, you know, a, a client, a, an architect or an interior designer or an art advisor or, mm -hmm. you, know, a, a, you know, a client, you know, coming to us directly. Um, they'll have an idea of dimensions. They'll mm -hmm. say, you know, I want whatever 32 by 43 and approximately in this color palette, like I'm, I want all blues or I'm interested in reds or whatever it is that they're, or maybe they've seen something we've done and they say, oh, I love this, but could I get this scaled to my dimensions? 
Um, and you know that's all possible, of course. But what we typically do is we start with photorealistic renderings. So um, this is, goes back to your earlier question about uh, Sean's previous uh, uh, sort of uh, mm. Uh, mm. you know work history. Um, it, it we draw everything up to scale in uh, in, fo in Photoshop, and um, we present several ideas to the client. The client likes them or says no we go back to the drawing board we get something approved at least a drawing some sort of rendering approved mm -hmm. um, and then we go into sampling so we sample 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 um, it's funny i talk to weavers and um people say oh i could never be bothered to sample it's just so much work <laughs> to get a warp on in the first place how do you sample and it's funny because we were we were actually talking about it you know kind of preparing for today and everything and, and we were thinking you know we put a lot of warps on i would say that maybe two out of three or maybe even three out of four warps that we put on looms are for sampling. So we are always sampling. It's, it always seems like we're sampling, which is another reason why we have multiple looms. Um, we're not exactly loom hoarders. You know, there are some people who have a lot of looms, but um, it's it's we have the number of looms we have because typically we'll have, you know, our two two workhorse looms going um, with long warps or something for a project. And inevitably a client will come to us and say, I need a sample for you know urgently in the next you know 10 days for a meeting you can't you can't you know what are you going to do you're in the middle of a project so if you have open equipment that you can you can leverage in that way it makes that process a whole lot a lot um quicker i guess or more efficient and you don't lose the project potentially um but i think the idea for us what you're saying in terms of a straight line mm -hmm. i think for us it's we try to do as much thinking and working out of what could go wrong. How do we, what do we want this to look like? We do as much work on, on the front end as possible, such that when we get to the weaving portion of it, I don't want to take the romance out of it. So don't misunderstand, but it almost becomes a mechanical thing because you know exactly what you're going to do. It's all been planned out methodically ahead of time and it's because it's mostly because wire is so unforgiving it's very unforgiving right yeah. i think you have to be a, a very strict with the medium when you're working with wire because mm -hmm. one wrong move and the piece is damaged truly right. so right right yeah yeah well the other thing i guess i was thinking about also don't you have to sometimes bring in other people to help problem solve because your your pieces aren't just flat things laying there. I mean, you're very three-dimensional a lot of times. So I think I heard you talking about you'd have to bring in other people to help design either how to hang it or a fixture oh, yeah. for it or something. Yeah, We work with engineers and fabricators. Like we have a, a bronze foundry that we work with. We have an amazing metal engineer that helps us, mm -hmm. you know, uh, put all the pieces together essentially and make all the metal. Um, but most of the designing we do all here in our studio, it's just the two of us. Um, but we do research certain things that we can't do in our studio. We do resource out. Definitely. I just think that's, it just boggles my mind. I feel like I struggle to do a plain weave sometimes. <laughs> and all the other things that you have to take in consideration is amazing. Well, you've kind of led me into the next question, question, which is we have a photo of your studio, which mm. is gorgeous. There we are. Everybody right now is going, oh, and <laughs> you, we see your looms. So talk a little more about, you said you do use one uh, maybe more for sampling than the other, or you have one available for sampling, but what else goes into the decision of which loom to use for which project? It depends on the width of the piece too. It, it right? depends on the width. So the two oh, looms okay. right now, these are both 60 inch, uh, 60 inch wide, uh, uh, you know, jack style looms. They're Le 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 Leclerc's, um, both 12 shaft. Um, and those are those are two workhorse looms. And actually, the one that Sean is at here with the white warp on it um, is probably our. This is before we replace the beams. Um, I'm pointing to it, but you can't see my finger. Um, but these are this is before we replace the 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 beams and the the, the breast beam and the back beam. Oh, okay. Um, that's probably our workhorse loom, um, and it's it's um, because of its width that it really is uh, you know quite quite good. Um, actually, you can't see it, but it's the one in the foreground here. It's another Leclerc. Um, it's another 12 shaft, but it's a little, it's a little narrower. Um, and that's our other workhorse loom. It's a really, really wonderful, um, just sturdy, sturdy loom. And there's the aforementioned shack spindle with the, uh, with the gold weaving over the top of it with a swift attached to the, to the front of it. Love that loom. So, but yeah, it really depends on what's open, what's available. And, um, you know, typically commissions come down the pike 
uh, you know, with enough heads up that we kind of schedule out what loom will weave which project. So and inevitably, yeah. designers always want to know how much wider we can go. And we, yeah, sixty is our is our widest at the moment, but yeah, bigger seems to always be better for some reason. Yeah. So it's not like oh, this loom can take can handle wire, but this loom can't. Sounds like you've set them all up to be able to do that. Um, I, you know, the one, the, the one with the metal beams on it now really is preferable for that purpose. Uh, we, um, the, there's one you can't see in this loom that, or in this picture rather, that uh, it's an, it's a tank of a loom. It's a Gilmore. Um, it, they're amazing looms, but I mean, it's a, it's literally, you could put a, you could drive it through a minefield. I swear it's such a big, heavy loom, but, um, uh, it just got absolutely decimated from the from the wire. Um, we need to replace the the uh, the brake system on it and the whole thing. So um, we kind of learned our lesson from it. We were just pushing it, pushing the equipment too far, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so We've yeah, also moved over to silk a bit too. That's to true. Kind of mitigate the the wire warp situation. Right. Yeah. That's another. That's, that's another a different conversation. conversation. <laughs> well, looking at your beautiful studio, I have a question for you. Yeah. What tool or thing, not the loom as a whole, but what tool or thing in your studio would each of you not be able to work without? Oh, each of us. Okay, that's, oh, that's each a of us. twist. Well, um, together, just, <laughs> you have to settle I, on one. Sorry, like this, yeah. I, you know, being able to uh, display your ideas, what's going on in your head is seemingly sometimes as an artist, the most complicated thing to be able to sell and to show somebody what's going on and, and what you want to create. Um, so being able to do Photoshop really is a, a, a modern tool that our studio uses, utilizes on a daily basis that can really pitch an idea to a, a designer or a client of what we're thinking about. And we can overlay our ideas into their rooms and their spaces or the renderings that they've already created. That really gives them a sense of what we're thinking. And on top of it, we also are able to um, try out different compositions, you know, try some new ideas, try some new colors, try mm -hmm. some new effects mm -hmm. that look like what we're going to create. You know, it's not like we have to always sit down and make a little sample to really kind of try and figure out what that thing is going to look like. So I think in a modern age that, I mean, Photoshop has really helped yeah. our company absolutely um, spread the word in a sense of like, um, I think even very visual people, very, you know, creative, creatively minded folks have a hard time really, really wrapping their heads around what a finished piece will look like. And if they can't do it, especially like for an interior designer, for example, they're not buying the work, their client's buying the work. So they have to communicate that then to another person. So for us, it's just to be able to generate those drawings almost as sales tools. It's really, really been very, very helpful for us. Um, I think in a way that maybe hand you know, hand drawing them, I'm sure has utility and value, sure. but, um, you know, we're able to draw them to scale then and pull dimensions from them and understand where, okay, that gradient actually is a 14 inch gradient, you know, and then you can really map out the piece based on the approved drawings. So I don't know how sexy this conversation is, but. Oh, it's sexy. <laughs> it's real sexy. Oh, to this crowd, they're loving it. They're loving it. <laughs> um, well, I also understand that you spin. So how did you get started in spinning? Yes, I, I always joke that if there's one thing I could do and money were no object, if I could do it for the rest of my life, it'd be spinning. I love really? it. Really? I love it. Um, yeah, I just got a, um, uh, oh, so here we go. So it all, uh, to answer your question, um, it all came from the fact that we do, uh, that we uh, design and fabricate furniture as well. So on the left here is one of our, uh, one of our chairs, it's called our Nimbus, uh, and it's a dining chair. It's all hand carved oak with um, this uh, custom lavender, uh, lavender kind of gray lacquer. Um, and for this, we wanted to do kind of a tone on tone, uh, uh, very kind of nubbly, like, uh, like a boucle on crack kind of. Mm -hmm. So um, it was about, um, for this, it was about core spun. This is all um, uh, core spun um, uh, merino, merino and silk um, with a little iridescent fiber. I don't know if you can see the iridescence, kind of, sort of, you can see a little bit. It's kind of a little blue bling in it, um, but it catches the light just right and it kind of looks almost frosty. So the idea behind this textile was to create something that kind of looked like, kind of like the decaying 
matter and rock at the bottom of the sea. So the shell, and all right? That. Yeah. Shells and rocks mm -hmm. and stuff. So um, that was that. Uh, but you, you know, it's all about that twist that you can see in it, and you know, it's really just corkscrews. We, I just love it. We had put out another collection called Oriform that had five seats, five chairs. Yeah. And we thought, what an opportunity to be able to create our own textile for our own chairs. So mm -hmm. it was really another, it was uh, a real clash of what our, a couple of our studio practices together. Yeah. And it was a really way to explore something, a piece of furniture that we designed with a textile that we created and designed that came together. So we had full control of the final piece. Um, and that's really kind of how spinning got started. we kind of got obsessed over it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we just got a, oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, we just got a brother drum carter, you guys. It's really cool. <laughs> also, they're not paying us anything either to say that. It's uh, it was uh, just kind of amazing. Uh, you know, it's it's fully electric, so both your hands are free, and you're just uh, it's just so much fun. So, love that drum carter. Oh, I don't know if I I don't know if I can live without it, but um, <laughs> I would I don't wanna I don't wanna live. I don't wanna. Yeah, you go. I like that. There's you gotta have it, and I don't want to live without right. it. Right. <laughs> Well, I've asked this of several of the guests on this show, and I'm always amazed at the answers I get. So I'm going to ask you guys, which is more important to you guys, process or product? Hmm. Well, they go hand in hand. I think they go hand it's in not hand. one or the other because yeah. the process is so important to the final product and the process is what the product is. Mm -hmm. And we have a definite idea of what that product is. And there's only one way to get there. Right. right. Yeah, I think so. So again, I, for us, it's about we have a, um, an exact result in mind, uh, mostly because that's what someone has come to us for. Um, they, they haven't really asked us to freestyle every once in a while. They're like, you know, it's a little finger guns and, and, and a, you know, a client is really just blue sky thinking, just go wild, Definitely. which is fun. Uh, it doesn't happen all that often. Um, but yes, yeah, so in that in that sense, everything is very uh, results oriented or, you know, uh, the, it's all about the finished piece or getting to that finished piece. Um, so I think the process is kind of designed around how to make that happen. So um, I think it really is. They're identical. It's in my mind. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you do a lot of commission work. How do you bring the designer or the client into the fiber world mm -hmm. so that they understand what's involved in producing what they want. Like, you can't just say, oh, I don't want that strand in there. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. This is such a good, good such question. a good question. We and it's something I'm not to interrupt, but this no. is something that we talk about All at the time. length. <laughs> how do we, how do we um, talk to our clients uh, in a way that isn't, patronizing or condescending, but it gives them a little bit of education um, in a way that they can feel comfortable and confident talking mm -hmm. about textiles. I think interior design, especially, and of course fashion, but interior design is very focused on textiles. There's not a whole lot involved with interior design that, I mean, other than hard surfaces and, you know, seating and stuff like that. It's all about textiles. So, um, but you know you can graduate from a textile or from an interior design program having had very very little formation in um, in textiles and understanding mm -hmm. their their architecture. So um, we yeah. always we like to start from a place of warp and weft, and we always send them um, a, our kit of materials, which is our set of wires and our set of silks. And of course, the silks are endless in terms of color, but we have like our palette, if you will. And we say, these are the colors that we're working with. These are the materials that we're working mm -hmm. with. And we give a little breakdown of like how weaving works. And it's not, we're not having them always, we can't always, especially during COVID, we can't have people to our studio, even though we try to get people here as much as possible to actually mm -hmm. see the looms and touch the looms and see how it comes together. Um, but it really starts with warp and weft from the beginning, because we're actually right. building a textile from the very beginning with a client. Yeah, and once that once that spark is lit, it's off to the races because mm -hmm. they people are like, oh, I get that. Okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. You right. Know? Do you find you have a hard time getting them to slow down or take the time to do it? You can tell that we've we've had mm -hmm. a couple of moments where uh, we were working with um, an interior designer, an interior design firm. I'm not going to name names. It was one of the probably top three design firms in the in the world. And the the um, 
the designer just wasn't getting it and she was really frustrated and she was starting to raise her voice with us. Actually, she was getting really, you could tell she was really frustrated because she wasn't able to get the information that she needed or wanted to, to be able to transmit. So, you know, in those instances, it hasn't happened that often, but in those instances, you know, we really take patience. It's about patience. It's about taking time and giving that person space to learn. Um, but also impressing upon them the fact that if you want to talk about this, it is important to just do a little bit of work and and wrap your head around some of these concepts. So mm-hmm. I think our role, I, we do see our role, I think, working with, it's educating. with designers is it's, it's uh, there's an educational kind of component on the on the front end. Well, I heard you in another conversation saying people are magpies. They mm-hmm. are attracted to shiny things. And I cracked up laughing because I thought, oh my <laughs> gosh, that is me. I am a magpie. And <laughs> one of my favorite magpie pieces is this um, Helios chandelier. I love this. Thank, thank and you. I was curious, what has attracted you to, to making light and why is it so important? Because that's not the easiest characteristic no, to put in a work is to get that light to show. That's a lot of work to make that happen. It is, yeah. Um, you know, I, our very first collection, um, the very first piece we did was a desk. It was a writing desk, and we called it Supernova. And you know, a supernova is the death of a star. So it's just this incredible electromagnetic phenomenon, right? It's just this. It radiates throughout the the galaxy, and it's just it's it's overwhelming, and it's all about light and energy. So light has always been kind of the mm-hmm. primary focus, I think, of, of sure. what we do. Um, and it's not just reflecting light, but also absorbing mm-hmm. light. How do you play with light? And I think especially with weaving, it's, it might not be the most immediately obvious characteristic of weaving. Um, maybe I'm wrong in thinking that, but um, it, it, it definitely drives our practice. Um, and, you know, I think this, this chandelier was a really good example of it. So that's me standing there. Um, I'm about six feet, so that gives you some sense of scale. So I think it was, um, I can't remember, 52 inches, 52 inches tall, something like that. This um, piece really was a, uh, a gestation of three different beauty practices, weaving being foremost, the first one, sculpture being the bronze torsiers that are on the perimeter. There's eight of them. Of course, there's eight weavings that go around. And then, of course, lighting being the third. And this was really a, a this kind of love child of these three different practices for our studio. <laughs> and we do see it as this almost like this explosion of light where the gradients at the center of the gold wire um, radiate from top to bottom into black. The torsiers are also light fixtures. We've embedded um, LED inside of those bronzes. So th- it was important for this piece to also be internally lit where you can see the lights, the LED lights on the inside, but also externally lit because the weavings do require so much light to make it twinkle. You know, there's, uh, we have conversations about our work is you can't, you, the moon is nothing without the sun, you know, and, and you can't get that romance without a little bit of shine on it. So. I don't yeah. know. It's it's light is everything. Light is yeah. who we are. So yeah. it, it is is very much about what our work is. We had a um, we just finished a, a really big piece that went off to New York, and the client um, the client wasn't. We were really happy with it. Was how the it most beautiful out. piece? <laughs> we were we really happy. How it, ever made. it was so amazing. But we didn't get, we didn't get good feedback from the client. They said it doesn't. It's not shiny. And well, you know, we we were working with a gallery at the time, so we were actually talking through him, and and um, it said, you know, he said he, she's really concerned because it it doesn't it doesn't give off light, and he said, well, send us a picture. So we looked at it, and all the lights were all off. the lights were off. So <laughs> it's sort of like you know, I don't want to use the I, don't, I should, probably shouldn't use this, uh, this metaphor, but <laughs> then, then don't. Well, like if you think about a. Um, uh, a mirror ball, like a disco ball, right? Oh, yeah. And right. if you have a disco ball in a dark room, you're not going to get disco, right? You're not going to so get disco. You've got to shine light on it to get disco, right? <laughs> so we kind of, we were kind of explaining this that, well, you've, you've hung it in the dark, first and of all. And they, they come at you angry. Yeah. And it was, it was shocking because we were like, no, really, no, this is literally the nicest piece we've ever made <laughs> without being boastful. But like, we were really proud of it. It was, oh, it was, it was beautiful. <laughs> and we were so proud of it. And they're like, no, it's not what I wanted. It's not it what like, I wanted. So like, make it again. It was like, but you're going to get the same thing. It's going to be the same. And effect. it's going to be the same effect. How about put some light on it? 
and let's t let's start the conversation over. Yeah. yeah. It was it was amazing. So, 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 they, so they lit it yeah. and it was perfect. They, yeah, they were happy with it. So yeah, they got. He has thicker skin than me. I don't, that would be hard for oh, somebody to say yeah. that to me. It's hard. <laughs> it is hard. It's hard. Well, you have, have to get over it. I mean, at first, it's yeah. it's there's a lot of ego involved sometimes yeah. when you're. It's already difficult to make work. Um, it's extra difficult to get it out there. It's harder to sell it. You know, it's like all these variables of like difficulty yeah, the challenges and then it. someone's like no i don't like it yeah well yeah. you know well, that kind of leads into my next couple of questions i may smoosh these together which is yeah. well how do you take care of yourself your artistic self how do you recharge mm -hmm. you know after you go through something like that either one you get bad feedback or you just send off this piece that's so important to you you put so much into it how do you take care of yourself after that mm -hmm. well we definitely we live near nature so we're we have two dogs so we go for long walks a lot which is definitely recharging and we process a lot and we talk a lot but I, the benefit of being two of us and we are married and we live together and our life is our work that we have each other to bounce ideas off of and you know we're not always in sync so we have the other person to rely on if something is out of whack so the benefit of being a, a, a pair is that there's always someone there for you um, I think as it would be difficult as a singular artist, you know, I don't know, never done it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, having someone there all the time allows you to kind of really process your thoughts and, mm -hmm. um, and what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I think we balance each other in that way as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. If I'm having a bad day, he's, you know, and vice I'm having you. a really good day. <laughs> 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 well, what about being able to do your creation for yourself? I mean, I hear you have to do a lot of commission works and you're trying to figure out what they want do you guys get a chance to do stuff just for you like sean do you do any more ceramics or definitely. do you weave just for yourself at times or we definitely do ceramics on our own time um we have a commission coming through for a large ceramic installation as well um but yeah we i think for every project we put on a little bit of extra warp so at that end of that warp we have I don't know, three feet, maybe six feet, where we're actually able to try the ideas that we have going in our heads yeah. and in our sketchbooks. Yeah. So that allows us to knock out a piece that, you know, that we've been dreaming that about, that we've been thinking about. If we oh, can okay. piggyback, I guess, on an existing uh, commissioned work, it, it gives us the, uh, you know, it gives us the the ability to, you know, take a, a few weeks and and explore something that we've been dreaming about. So it's, yeah, it works out yeah. in that way. I mean, we have a ceramic studio out in the back that we actually go out there and get our hands all dirty too. So, oh, uh, great! Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I understand you're you're doing something new and different. The laminated glass. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what that is. I yeah. hope you share that with us. Can you talk about laminated glass and what that is? Sure. So uh, there was a slide at the very beginning with the video. Um, That's this a nice is, picture. This was a nice video. Um, this well, this was this is our we'll get back to glass. We'll get back to glass. This, this, is, is, a, our, this is a fun video. <laughs> so this was one out of six panels that got to sent to Nanjing in China. In China um, during the pandemic, we had gotten the commission before, and this client um, asked us to create panels that, as you got off the VIP elevator on the thirty fifth floor, like that, yeah. and walked into the like a lounge bar, these were scrim like pieces. So there were six different designs and they all kind of floated in space and we created a, um, a custom hanging mechanism for them. But this is our broken twill and, and being that our work is going more commercial more public spaces, we really thought long and hard during the pandemic at how do we get this work into these spaces where we're, it's actually protected because metal is delicate. It does have memory. You know, you put a finger through it that holes there. So we, realize that we could laminate this work and not everything can be laminated in glass and it just happens that this textile that we developed works beautifully in between two panes of glass. Um, so essentially we are able to now install this work in public in public space without it really having to worry about the, the element of people touching the right. work, you know. Because it, it, to get back to the magpie point, people want to touch it. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> It's an interesting thing. We um, we participated in a group show right before. Oh, here's the here's the glass. Thanks, Whitney. 
So um, it's, this is a low iron glass. So you're not getting some of that green tint, some of the, but you can see it's embedded in this way. And this is a structurally reversible um, uh, structure. Um, and so it works on both sides and we're floating it between two rooms kind of in an opening um, for a project we have, we have coming up right now in the Middle East, so. Um, well, I, I don't uh, want to take up too much time in how to, but I'm dying to ask. So yeah. you, you weave something and then you yeah. put the glass around it? Yes. Are you sandwich it between glass? Yeah. The weaving is sandwiched yeah. between two planes of, planes of glass. We, we don't do this in our studio. We take it to a glass manufacturer. It, it goes into an autoclave. So they actually right. Right. Okay. kind of like suck the air out of it almost uh, with heat and, you know, pressure. pressure. Um, and there's a, sort of a medium in between, um, in between the, the, the layers. So, um, you know, we're not the first, first to, to laminate uh, a textile between glass by any stretch. But um, you know, we we looked at this and, and it, it just kind of made sense. So um, we're we're getting some good interest with uh, with this direction now, which is which is fun. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, what's next for you guys? Well, well, we've got um, we've got a number of commissions lined up. Um, we're finishing a, a project uh, or a, a, sing, a single weaving for a client in Moscow right now in Russia. Um, we're um, just sort of earlier this year, pretty much all year, we've been talking about Kuwait. So we have a wonderful, wonderful client um, and her, um, her family in Kuwait, and they're building a beautiful, beautiful home. Um, and we're doing, uh, we're doing, it's actually four projects in one. We're doing four installations for, the, for that, that, that project, one of which is the ceramic installation uh, that Sean's, Sean's going to be working on. Um, we have a show and we're that same chandelier that helio chandelier we're doing that one was black and gold we're doing a silver and gold and the bronze for that house um we're doing a, a screen, screen with the glass and then we're creating these um monolithic woven panels that are embedded in glass that will bifold open to create window coverings oh. 12 foot by 12 foot something like that it's, yeah it's a lot it's it, a lot of weaving it's big <laughs> it's big well, i'm so. glad you're staying busy yeah. Yes. Yeah. Post pandemic, it was a bit whiplash. It, yeah, it's strange. yeah. We we sort of think of it like a kind of pulling back a rubber band almost, and it's kind of like it's all kind of coming at once, um, which is which is fine. It's better that than the alternative, I suppose. <laughs> well, as I expected, we have tons of questions. So um, let's, let's see what people want to do. Um, to start with, I'm going to skip the what is the wire questions. That <laughs> Thin, uh, very thin. Oh, <laughs> uh, how have you have you done external uh, outdoor installations, and if so, where are they and how are they maintained? Hmm. Outdoor, we have not done any no outdoor. outdoor. Um, no, no. We had a, a small bronze sculpture out um, outside for a minute, but that wasn't a. Uh, Weaving. Uh, weaving. <laughs> no, we haven't. Uh, I, we'd love to do it. Um, question asker, if you know of anyone who's looking. We, you know, Come on, Karen. Just contact them and we'll get this going, right? Let's do this. All right. Well, Suzanne wants to know, is the weft for the metal hangings also wire? The weft itself? Yeah. Yes, it is. Oh, um, nice. And, you know, the, the earlier work that we were doing, we're doing a little bit more of it now. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was wire in both warp and weft. Um, we, kind of, uh, we kind of maxed out on our width a little bit. As we mentioned earlier, it was kind of chewing up our looms in a way that wasn't pretty on the, the warp, because yeah. of the warps. So we actually moved everything to silk. And we do mostly everything over silk now. And in that way, too, we're able to um, increase the width significantly. Um, but yeah, the weft is, is all, all, all wire. We also yeah. went silk warps because we were able to roll the weavings. When they're wire, metal, uh, weft, and warp, the work has to ship flat. So that's oh. a consideration we have to always think mm -hmm. about because shipping costs go up and, and whatnot. But being able to roll the whole piece up has yeah. streamlined things quite a bit we have a client who wants one uh, who wants a weaving uh that's like 58 inches wide by like 13 feet long or something but all wire and it's like well you're we're gonna have to build a very large crate for it just so you're just so you're aware but I don't know, like they seem not to mind too much so you never know but they have to be flat packed which is a different thing oh well petty said on you hi petty 
How do you wind a metal warp? I will tell you all a secret. It's all about sectional warping. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you hear it, heard, heard it here first. Yeah, you heard it here first. It's not from. It's not front to back. It's not back to front. It is sectional warping because if you think about wire, it always has to be main. You have to maintain just a little bit of tension on it at all times. Otherwise, it's going to spring up on itself. So the sectional warp allows you to pull it off like a. a you know, like a, a, a what, what's the word I'm looking for, like a warping mill or something like this, right? So spool it up beforehand and then work on the sectional, uh, you know, section at a time. Um, but it's all about keeping it under those kind of tight, you know, kind of constraints while you're working with it. You can't let it kind of, you can't drop it and just let it kind of shroing, you know? So it's all about sectional warping. That's what I'll say. Um, Jane Kaplan wants to know, Hi, Jane. no, we're not gonna tell you the gauge. Um, on, talk about the aloe. She wants to know if you get materials from Metaphorius in Manhattan. No, I have to look it up. What do they do? Uh, and she says your work is great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. That's very Shout kind. Out there. Um, Sandra Schultz wants to know, I, I do too, what kind of shuttle do you use? Uh, so because of, uh, because it's wire, uh -huh. um, trying to put it on a pern or a bobbin, you don't want to make springs. So we're not making springs because this is a kink free zone, you like to say. Right. <laughs> so if you're putting it on, you know, if you're putting it on a pern or a bobbin or something like that and throwing just a traditional, you know, boat shuttle or what have you, um, you're going to get kinks and that's going to show up in the surface of the piece. So this is the part that's really, really slow and tedious. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be done on stick shuttles. So it's super primitive, you know, in that regard. It's really, there's no wild technology or anything to get the wire across um and that way it but just it controls you know, it very well it though. controls it yeah. so well um yeah and it yeah and it's there's no just, it takes a lot of the spring out it takes all of the spring out so that's that's that <laughs> christine, you got a good eye christine she wants to know what kind of building is your studio what was its other life yeah so this house is 101 years old now yeah it's um spanish style and it's super romantic and yeah. it looks like a church but it's not it was originally built for a doctor and his family um it's really it has a beautiful courtyard uh, it has a lot of original details it's kind of ranch it's rancho revival so it had and also mission revival kind of smashed together a little together bit. yeah um but yeah it has these beautiful 14 foot tall ceilings here at the apex and we found this we found this place just on a whim and it's really romantic and it's out in the middle of San Bernardino and it's quiet and it's near the mountains and we have a courtyard. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's we we it's very important for our studio to to work around beauty and beautiful architecture because if you're going to be in something, I don't want to be inside of a, a you know big concrete box or anything like that. You know, it's got you have Depends to be around, on the concrete box, I guess. Yes, that's true. Good yeah. point. If it's a famous architect, sure, yeah, never know. But like <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's really romantic and beautiful and it has a lot of, you know, charm. Yeah. It is gorgeous. It's very gorgeous. Thanks. Um, do you do any teaching? Uh, Deborah Prindle was asking that. That's a good question. Do you teach at all? You know, no, we don't. Um, would love to. Um, it, we gave a seminar. We've done some talks and yeah, some talks. lectures and things like that for um, for some schools, but um, we've never done any teaching. No, no, of course. Um, we've talked about know. it. We've yeah. talked about it. Yeah, we have an idea for what class. I yeah. see in your future coming to Convergence <laughs> and <yeah>. giving talks <laughs> and lectures. Yeah, let's we would do love it. to have you there. That'd be lovely. Uh, Michelle wants to know, um, do you do the upholstery on the furniture or do you take your woven fabric to someone to install it? Do you show at galleries? So yes, we work with a beautiful upholsterer. Um, in Los Angeles, who knows exactly how to handle our work. Um, and we right now we are represented with Needler for Share in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Denver. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to go through these. Some of these have already been answered, so I don't want to ask you again. Um, Andrea Tyson, Tyson, your designs are wonderful. I agree. Thank you. She taught textiles for interior at a commercial art school years ago and got in trouble for her preference in promotion of natural fibers. The industry didn't like that. Have you experienced this? 
You know what? We hmm. developed a textile for another big firm for a project that they were doing in, I think, somewhere in China. It was Shenzhen. Shenzhen. And it yeah. was a mixture of synthetics and uh, silk. Yep. And it got to be a really strange thing because we were going to hang them sort of like old school tapestries, you know, like above really the above the beds. It was going to be a thing. But of course, they had to be fireproofed because people still have a hard time with weaving as art. So you have to convince them that it's art. And um, it, it, even if it's coded in the right way, or if it comes through the purchasing agent in the right way, or what have you, um, and they, they weren't going to be framed still out. Struggling. They, they weren't, weren't going to be framed, framed out. out. So they had to guess what? Be fireproofed. So it had to undergo, we had to undergo all this yeah, to get a flame cert craziness. And um, in the end, it ended up being this uh, just, a, just a crazy, crazy thing that didn't pan out because of the materials for specifically that reason. The flame retardant destroyed the silk. It absolutely destroyed the silk. Um, oh. Yeah. And we were using it was kind a Japan of, thread. it was a Japan thread that had this, it's like a rice paper that has a laminated metal on top of it. That's spun over rayon it was a kind of a crazy it just thing, once that liquid hit it the, the textile just went it just, just exploded totally almost. exploded it just turned to i don't know if we answered your question did we answer the question i'm not sure i don't we, know but it was a great answer yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> um we got some glass questions here oh good great she's this is from sherry and she says is it fused how high do they take it she goes, I'm a glass person too. Ah, yes. So we also do some kiln form glass, some, some um, warm glass. Um, it's not done no. in a kiln. No, it's not heat, it's not heat, heat formed. It's not heat formed in any way, not kiln okay. formed. Okay. Um, it is, so you've got one sheet of glass, right? Your bottom sheet. And then there's a medium that goes over it. Then your weaving goes on top of that. And then another medium goes on top of the weaving. And then a, your second piece of glass goes on the top. So it's smooshed together and um, it goes into an autoclave. So it actually goes into a machine that through heat and pressure uh, makes it all fused together. Fused together so but not to too hot. But not fusing like multiple layers of glass might fuse together with bubbles in the whole mm -hmm. thing. It's, it doesn't get that hot. The glass doesn't actually touch. And it, the glass doesn't melt uh, to each other. Doesn't right. touch itself. That's true too. Yeah, the, the two the layers, two layers of glass don't actually touch. So, so there's that, no concern about it coming apart, though. No, 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 no. I think you'd really have to want to get it apart, and it would probably. I don't explode. think you could. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, you could. yeah. I don't um, think. would you talk about this? Is from Mary Holm. Would you talk about the trade-off between the flexibility and drape that's so fundamental in woven textile, and the stability that the glass panels give? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I kind of struggled with this a little bit when we first when we first mm. pulled the the first piece um, out of the autoclave, and we looked at it, and it was sort of like the textile can't breathe. I like had <laughs> this I had this weird feeling like it, the the textile literally can't breathe, and um, you know, it, it, I think it, it, the glass all came from a place of like Sean said. Um, wanting to, to put our textiles in public places that could potentially come in contact with public fingertips. So um, it was just a way of creating something that still had the look and the feel and the, the warmth um, while allowing it to right. be its own thing, but also, uh, you know, to have a, a little more protection. Yeah, and, and an effort to, to accomplish one detail, which is, you know, sandwiching our fork in between glass, you do lose that drape, but we, we gained something else, you know, something unexpected. The glass almost elevates the weaving to a place that we didn't expect. It gets, a, it's a little shinier. It feels almost like trapped in time you know i feel like, like, like it'll be locked in amber it'll, it'll lock to be exactly locked yeah. in amber that's nice um it has almost sort of like looking through a um a really shallow magnifying glass too so it really kind of amplifies i think the uh the woven structure inside um and it doesn't i mean it's it's uh translucent and structurally reversible again so you, you can you know you can look at it and and see the same effect from both the front and the back and we're so also exposing cool. the selvage a lot. And we, I, that's the other thing too. Yeah, it's a good point. To expose Even the selvage. I don't, we don't see it in that sample. You don't you see it in that sample, but um, you know, to expose the selvage, I'm a, I'm a big, big proponent of seeing everyone's selvages. I want to see your selvage, you know, and I'm not, I'm not um, you know, 
spilling tea or anything about about yes. other people's work but you know when you when you wrap something around a frame i i don't i lose the hand then i lose the sense of the soul of the of, you know throwing your shuttle I, I i lose that the the poetry of um you know of your picks so to speak so um i it was really important for us also just to see a little bit of that of the, the salvage um like in that glass so it still has that sense of um that hand woven quality you know there's been a return to craft. Like there's, yeah. Yeah. there's a return to craft in in the industry and and any way that we can find a way to get craft into the public hemisphere yeah. um is so important and yeah. the glass really allows us to do that yeah it's the, so, it's the imperfections in the hand too and we always say too you know art if art is meant to evoke uh, meant to evoke an emotion you have to remember that perfection is not an emotion so working toward perfection is sort of like well come on you know there's got to be more to it than that so yeah oh that's lovely yeah. i like that i like that well karen leblanc was one who asked about do you do you have a piece outdoors and she said just let sean and andrew know she'll be in touch perfect, so, perfect. there Sounds you good. go there Thanks, you go hi karen <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Um, okay. I think we have one more question here. Um, what leaf structures do you use? I know you talked about a twill. Mm -hmm. Yep, broken yep. twill. So we do a broken twill. Um, we do most of the, the the larger wall pieces are all um, uh, satin. It's a satin weave. Um, weft faced. It's all weft faced for the most part. Um, but the broken twill came from kind of a, a response to that as well. That you know we needed something that could be seen from both sides. That was a balanced weave for the most part. Um, and you know a balanced weave will hang flat. Mm -hmm. The weft faced stuff, all the satin stuff, when you when you put it on the wall, because the the front of it, where the you know the weft. It, it's so heavy it wants to pull off the wall and so you it kind of comes off in a way that's um that's that's different so the the broken twill allows it to hang very very flat as well um but yeah i mean other than those that, are two our two main two oh, yeah two main, structures. two main structures um and then you know we dabble in other things do some linos and things like that which is always fun but um for the most part satins and twills broken twill well i can't believe it it's time to quit for the day but this oh, come on. I've learned so much and <laughs> it's just fascinating. To this has been such a pleasure. It's all the different ways it's that fiber goes. And this is a completely new way for me. And I'm sure everybody really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for being on here and giving us your time. It's been our pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I want to come see your space. I just love that stuff. <laughs> come on down. Here we are. Yeah. Whitney, you heard them. They said we can come. Yeah. All right. Well, I do want to thank you all for watching today and watching these guys go to their website. They have beautiful images. I love your photographer. Great photos. Um, you can learn more about their work and their processes um, and go to their, their website, um, DougalPaulson.com and check out more of, of their work and what there is to see. A big thank you today to Shaq Spindler. Um, you can see all their beautiful made wheels and looms and accessories and a loom similar to the one that, you know, Dougal and Sean use here, I mean, Paulson use. Um, and also on their website, it's really interesting, you can see how they got started doing looms. It's a great flashback, good Thursday flashback thing. So go to their website, uh, shekspindle.com. If you would like to sponsor a episode of Textiles and Tea or your guild or your business, please go to our website at wespendye.org and you can uh, see the information on how to sponsor an episode. Textiles and Tea is generously supported by the donations to the Fiber Trust. If you like programming like this and would like to see more, please support HTA by donating or um, becoming a member or both on our website at weavespendie.org. If you enjoyed this episode today, and I'm sure everyone did, and you would like to watch it again, or you missed part of it, or you'd like to share it with a friend, you can see this episode and all the episodes on the HGA Facebook page. You do not have to have a Facebook account to watch. You can just watch the episode. We are also putting these on YouTube. They will, um, if you go onto YouTube and subscribe to the HGA YouTube page, you'll get a notification every time we get a new YouTube episode up. Um, so, you know, go check that out also. 
Thank you all so much for being here today. It's, it was a wonderful uh, episode. I'm glad you were here. Next week, we have John Malarkey. We're excited about that. Have a great week and happy tea.